I won't compare him to my professor at MIT, but but this little this little guy, we called him uh, Bug. He was like our, and, and we also called him Woodpecker because he was always pecking at us with information. But he would come up into the lab, and there were students, grad students, visiting scientists, postdocs. <clears throat> And he knew more about everybody's research than they knew almost. It was incredible. <laughs> but wow. what he would do is when you had a chance to have an audience with him, number one, it was very uncomfortable. Number two, he would throw out ideas. He would just start throwing out ideas. And when I first got there, I didn't realize what it was all about. You know, I didn't realize I had to be the filter. I thought they were all like things I should follow. So I went down a couple of blind paths, but I soon found out that he just had this, this mind that was so active. He was just throwing things out stream of consciousness. And it was our job to deflect the ones that were, that didn't make any sense, at least from our judgment and those that made a lot of sense. And thought we thought we'd pursue. Yeah. I'm not comparing Mike Adams to Dr. Wright. And I mean, he was the youngest chair professor in the history of MIT and then the provost and then became chancellor at Washington university. So not a, not a dumb guy, but, but Mike Adams is kind of the same way. I view him kind of the same way. It's not that we want to take everything he says verbatim, but he's stirring up, you know, an opportunity to think outside the box, which I think Absolutely. is important. You know, like, I mean, I don't read all his stuff. I don't have time to do that. But I, I, I do a quick survey and, and just gets me thinking a little bit about um, some things that we may we may assume it's copacetic when it really isn't. <clears throat> you know, yeah. that's that's all I can that's all I can say. And with that, we should probably um, pursue today's topic, which is nutrient density. Really, our our dietary style. And just a, a quick story I told the group that came on earlier is I have a, a very bright lady, older lady that had quote unquote a stroke as diagnosed under Kaiser. About 18 days after her second vaccination, so first was in early February, second was in early March, then mid-March had the stroke, but it was preceded by uh, severe migraines, okay? And um, and because it was far enough apart between the vaccinations that she really didn't, she didn't try to link the two. But it, it's very clear the linkage because she everything else shows that she's a relatively healthy individual. But besides what Mike Adams is suggesting for antidotes to the vaccine, I, I still think your best defense is you you have to be healthy. You have to take this opportunity now to optimize your health. And so nutrient density is where it's all at. You know, there are 69,000 ICD-10 codes for diagnoses. In Dr. Carter, in my world, really four mechanisms. And the first one is, is good or poor repair and recovery. Food choices, absorption. Second one is you know, dysbiosis in the gut, mainly, and sensitivities anywhere in the body. Um, the third is, are you always in a fight or flight, you know, thrive versus survive? And the shockwave device that Dr. Carter is uh, uh, a cheap advisor to proves this is an important mechanism because when that device wakes up immunity in tissue that's relatively, you know, healthy, but problematic at the same time, it heals that in many cases, not all cases, right, Amy, but in, in many cases. And, the, and then the fourth mechanism is stealth infections, but really poor repair and recovery tied to nutrients. So watch our video we did at the beginning of the year called the Genesis of Health what minerals do, what micronutrients do, not the macronutrients is critical to this whole discussion. It's probably gonna be a couple part um, series here, part one today, nutrient density, the best diet style. I put the word diet in quotes because I think anytime you use the word diet, it really could infer a deficiency. So I really should refer this as an eating style and, you know, there are many good ones out there, paleo, Mediterranean, things like that. But I don't even really think we should subscribe to a particular silo. I think just like with anything, it's, it's the variety is the spice of life, diversity, diversity and quality. 
so with that, you know, why do we need to even worry about this? You know, I, I presented at the A4M on their 25th anniversary, oh, two and a half years ago, maybe it's three and a half years ago, time flies, right? But then the topic was called Back to the Future of Medicine, because I think medicine has clearly lost its way with um, 1980 with, with um, Harvard Pilgrim, the first HMO, and, and the FDA allowing drug, allowing drug companies to participate in medical education, 1980, big inflection point. So, um, so back to the future, before there is a more peaceful, uh, a patient-centered time, you know, um, Johns Hopkins, Grand Rounds. All, of, all the specialists came to you rather than you getting scurried off to various specialists that aren't communicating to each other. Steve Jobs in Walter Isaacson's uh, book um, on the biography of Steve Jobs, uh, Colleen Powell, his wife, had to take over his care from all the different silos at Stanford, okay, because they were mismanaging Steve Jobs. So if Steve Jobs can't get good care today, good coordinated care today, how can we? You know, so it's it's an interesting discourse. So the best thing you can do is get into that. It's not preventative medicine. It's it's move yourself down the con continuum on the better side. And this is a little example on, and it, it ties right to nutrients. In this case, in this case, it ties to macronutrients. But the U.S. in terms of death rate from coronary heart disease is tied with many third world countries. Okay, South Africans, go easy on me. Um, you're not third world. I work with a, a great clinician, Raul Goldberg, out of Cape Town on a regular basis. Um, but, you know, when you look at South Korea, France, Japan, uh, one third the mortality rates per capita from coronary heart disease. And South Koreans, a lot of fermented foods, Japanese, a lot of fish, a lot of sake. Um, French, highest consumption of saturated fats of any nation. And it's not like they're 100% higher than in other countries. They're 100% higher than the U.S., double, in terms of saturated fat consumption on a percentage basis. But compared to other European nations, they just, you know, a few percentage points, even, even tenth of a percentage points higher than, than some nations. But saturated fats are very important anti-inflammatory, okay? Infections, COVID, cytokine storm, inflammation. So anything you can do to affect an anti-inflammatory environment. Judy and I were just talking about C-reactive protein. I did a, I went to a poster session at Harvard, oh, 15 years ago, maybe more. And the Navy SEALs were presenting data that showed a very clear correlation in their endurance activities, recovery, and C-reactive protein, C-reactive protein marker for inflammation. And it, it was no baseline. The lower the C-reactive protein, way below what the standard of care considers normal, and even way below what we consider normal, the lower that value was, the better the recovery for the individual for yet more hard work um, the next day. Uh, beating themselves silly Navy SEALs, right? What they do. So on with the show. Really, you know, this this mechanism, you know, even though uh, pa Pasteur had like 10, 20% of the entire French scientific budget when he was operating, um, you know, pasteurization, uh, you know, really, really an advanced scientist, um, germ theory, <clears throat> one germ causes one disease. You know what? He, in some respects, he's substantially right in, in many, re, many respects, or at least forward thinking compared to where we are today in the realm of infectious diseases. But the important thing that he is given credit for saying on his deathbed is that as important as pathogens may be in terms of a disease mechanism, your internal terrain is much more important. And he gave kudos to his contemporary, uh, Claude Bernard. I read the book about Bernard. He wasn't as famous, but he really was the first <laughs> true medical scientist with an MD degree, truly a, a scientific thinker. And, and I love his quote 
the experimenter who doesn't know what he's looking for won't understand what he finds. And I find that so often in health in general, when we talk about root cause, but particularly looking at causation due to an, an infectious antecedents. You know, once an infection takes hold, it can multiply, it, it can hide, it, it can change your DNA to allow itself to remain viable. But the key thing is for all of us and COVID, it's very clear that if we lower our infectious burden and we, we lower our cytokines, our inflammatory markers, we'll do much better against all these diseases. So it's said that um, Pasteur recanted his germ theory at his deathbed and said, you know, um, it, it's really the internal environment that's the most important thing. And that's what nutrient density is all about. And so here's one of, one of my quote unquote mentors, you know, Dr. Trump, Dr. McCulley, uh, Dr. Carter, Dr. Barodi, you know, um, Claude Bernard is right up there as, you know, just a, a giant in creating medical scientific knowledge. And I love it. <clears throat> Basically, what he says is balance. We need to achieve balance. He says the fixity of the milieu supposes the perfection of the organism such that the external variations are at each instant compensated for and equilibrated. That's really okay. Complicated translation from the French, but so practical in terms of what it really means. So if you're a diabetic, what it means is if you're a diabetic, you're out of balance and your sugars are going to vary crazy. But if you're insulin sensitive, they won't, they won't vary much. That's what he's saying. If you can inter attain that internal equilibrium, you know, gut, some people just a little bit, you know, Gundry's made a, a fortune on this by talking about a tomato being bad for you. But if you're the fixity of your milieu of the, of your gut is good, you can eat that tomato and you're not going to see those kind of perturbations <clears throat> most likely. But if it's out of whack, then you're going to see wide variations in symptoms in your gut. So really what, what uh, Claude Bernard's talking about is a cornerstone of all health. Really, he's, he's, he's the giant. Um, some historical stuff, how the mid-Victorians worked eight and died. Mid-Victorians mid lived around 1870. And they're talking about the mid-Victorian British in particular, Paul Clayton from Oxford. Paul's a smart guy. I've had a few conversations with him. He's no longer in the dreary uh, marine, <laughs> marine environment uh, climate in England. He, he lives in the, the U.S. and the Bahamas. Uh, oh, no, France and the Bahamas, even better. So anyway, what he says is that you have to start, if you want to measure people for longevity, you have to start at age five because infant zero to five mortality has varied so greatly, whereas five plus is a fairly stable across generations, centuries, eons, really. So when, he's, when you talk about life expectancy at five or, uh, five or older, that Brits today actually live less well and less long compared to the mid-Victorians. Okay, and they had 10% of the degenerative diseases as, as we do. They had relatively little access to alcohol, tobacco, and high intake of fruits, whole grains, oily fish, vegetables, and consume levels of micro and phytonutrients at approximately 10 times of the levels considered normal, RDAs, if you will, today. And also, they are very, very active. At the A form, I showed a picture of these guys digging you know, infrastructure by hand in England, they, you know, 20 tons of soil a day was not uncommon for a single worker to lift. So they were very physically active. Um, so there's Dr. Clayton and says, those that survived the perils of childbirth and infancy lived as long as we do, and they were healthier while they were alive. Okay. And so um, I have another little slide in here first, and we'll go into what Clayton said that they were eating. Um, but first, you know, longevity to dispel anything about, you know, we only live to like 35 when in, in the beginning of the, the 20th century, you know, George Washington, 67, but I have these molars here. Uh, he suffered from poor dental health throughout his adulthood, beginning in his twenties had experienced regular toothaches, decay and tooth loss. Okay. 
So no wonder he only made it to 67. You know, chubby little Ben Franklin, 84, John Adams, 90. They didn't have any special things going on, you know, water, sanitation, wood and coal fired heating systems, all that trips across the, across the Atlantic. Um, it wasn't an easy life, but yet still John Adams, Ben Franklin, uh, outliving the average life expectancy today by quite a good amount. So, but let's look at what the mid Victorians <clears throat> ate, you know, a lot of folks say, you know, it's expensive to eat well. And I would argue it's, it's time consuming to eat well more than it is expensive. Planning. Planning is a big part of this. If you've listened to me before, I used to complain a long, long time ago, but I tell the story of being born to lower middle class Polish immigrants. I said I couldn't have been born to some wealthy steed or whatever. But now I realize, you know, the way they ate and the, was very much mid-Victorian-like. You know, a lot of fermented foods, a lot of healthy foods. We grew our own. We canned. We froze. You know, we had a, my dad was the original organic gardener, had three mulch piles. He turned, turned them every year, and the third one went back into the soil. So, um, and, you know, it was labor, the labor of love. But, you know, onions. Um, Beta glucans, one of the things that um, I think. What else? Well, onions have uh, quercetin, right, Michael? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So they have a number of different things that are antiviral, and they're among the cheapest vegetables: cabbage, carrots, turnips. You know, uh, uh, somewhere it mentions artichokes, and we'll get to this to, um, next week, maybe. But artichokes are some of the best. You know, best vegetable, I assume they're vegetables. Sometimes they get confused by uh, the different categories, watercress, but, you know, the Jerusalem artichoke. So very, very high in, in, in nutrients. You know, I have a, a friend told the story on Monday as well. He's a traditional doctor. Um, he's my athletic buddy. And I was telling him that I'm, I'm making pate now and I'm using um, radishes as chips. And he says, well, in my household, we kind of eat the same narrow range of vegetables all the time. And I think what we need to do, and what we see on these food sensitivity tests, and when you eat the same thing all the time, you have slight elevated IgG, you know, immunoglobulin titers for those foods. So I think the best thing you can do is diversify. Diversify what you eat. And so even at Walmart, yes, I go to Walmart sometimes, you know, and, and get vegetables and you know, they have all kinds of diversity there. Um, I belong to a, a, a group called the Renovatus. They bring in recovering addicts to do um, organic gardening, and I get most of my stuff from, from them, fortunately. So it's a, a really great program. But um, legumes and nuts, very, very high in nutrient density, particularly mineral content. Okay. Um, Brazil nuts, you want to have a, um, you want your thyroid axis working well, you need selenium, nothing, uh, no food higher in selenium content than Brazil nuts. And there's a, uh, just to show that I'm a Yankee, there's a priceless food store about six miles from me. And they're one of the few stores around here that have, um, that have Brazil nuts. So every once in a while, I'll get a a container of those. So let's see what else. I mean, fish and seafood. So I have a little show and tell. Um, I do my herring. Oop, I ripped the label off on this one, but it, it's pickled in red wine sauce with onions and all kinds of other little vegetables mixed into it. And if it's a little too sweet for you, no big deal. Uh, Professor Plum at Worcester Polytech was hired by NASA. And what he showed is, you know, you do three rinses, it's much better than one. Three small rinses cleanses the whatever you, whatever contaminants you're trying to get out of any particular bottle, liquid, whatever, than one big rinse. So, you know, sometimes I don't like the flavor that they have in some of these uh, pickled things, so I just rinse it out. No big deal. I've been eating a lot of oysters, and there was an issue about you know bottom feeder bottom feeders collecting toxins. Well, we can do atomic absorption and 
pretty easily and figure out if these things are really harboring toxins. But right now I'm more focused on anti-inflammation. Um, where's my favorite from the, my sushi, my first sushi experience, experience, um, eel, you know, once again, for sea urchin, if you've never had sea urchin, I'd highly recommend it. I had that with my friend, uh, visiting scientist at MIT, Shinichi Tanaka, um, vice president of Toyobo Corp. But he, uh, when he, he left sadly after six months of, um, being at MIT. And then he came back four years later and contacted me and I had sushi for the first time it was probably in the mid 1980s in downtown New York. And, um, I had to have a little, I had to have a little sake with that one just in case, but it was delicious. Um, yeah, I can, I'm concerned about rare, rare and raw meats, Toxoplasma gondii. So pickling will, will take care of that. Um, meats consumption of meat was considered a mark of a good diet and, um, and his complete absence was, was rare. This, again, is Paul Clayton's work on how the mid-Victorians lived, eat, and died. So I, I'm lucky enough to be living down three miles down Greenbrier from uh, Stinson's Black Angus Farm, and I see the cattle out there grazing. And the uh, butcher shop, it's hardly a butcher shop, is a little, little set of dilapidated buildings where they're doing the... Uh, the uh, meat processing. And now when I come, they know that um, I want the organ meat. I'm not a huge fan of beef organ meat, but you know, I get the tongue, it's the highest in fat. I get the heart, heart's actually a very delicious steak. Um, I, I get the liver and I'll make pate out of that. I won't eat it straight up or cook it. Um, but I'll also put that in the bone broth. I'll put all these things in the bone broth and let it simmer very gently for uh, four to six days and then freeze that off and then, then bring that out periodically. So, you know, organ meats, when we get to that section of this talk, which will probably be next week, week after whatever, um, we won't, we'll get about a third of the way through today. Highest, highest, highest in, in nutrient, broad-based nutrient density. It's every, every nutrient you need, absolutely not, but broadly high nutrient density, high, high rating. And we'll show, some of the world experts who measure nutrient density very accurately and scientifically will argue that organ meat. So I've never liked organ meat. Um, I'm adapting to it, but a duck organ is organ meat is really for someone who really like turns his nose up to um, beef organ meat. Um, duck organ meat is really quite fantastic. Very light, very subtle. Um, quite easily incorporated into other foods without an overbearing taste, highly recommend it. And then the duck fat itself, you know, I will bake the duck and take the fat and put it on various uh, um, other foods, just like a butter. It's fantastic. Um, there's a restaurant up in Portland, Maine called duck fat. It's French fries, but it's all um, cooked in, in duck fat. Really, fan, really a fantastic thing, but we just got to, just, you know, I guess the moral of the story is think diversity, not just one class of food and not just one set of foods within that class. So it's interesting that I had a little, we had one raw milk farm that used to do a little milk run, literally a milk run around here. And it always looked, upset my stomach a little bit. I haven't had it in several years, but a lot of people swear by the, um, the raw milk, and I think it's a good. I think it's clearly a good thing. And, and Michael, talking about an A and a B cow. Oh yeah, what's the the beta A two cows versus the beta A one? So the A two cows are more untouched, <laughs> shall we say? You know, the A one cows is uh, the crossbreeding and <clears throat> much more of a problem for most people in terms of casein sensitivity. However, even with the A two cows. And, you know, uh, having that as, a, you know, let's say foundational or heirloom uh, type scenario, uh, a lot of people still have sensitivity to casein. And even with goats, you know, and, and goat milk is, is considered an A2 um, variant. So, um, so without doing food sensitivity testing, <clears throat> you really, really don't know. Um, 
how your body is reacting because so many people just have hyperpermeability syndrome. Right. I appreciate the Michael. Yeah. Some of these slides aren't in perfect focus. You know, uh, uh, I apologize for that. They'll be clearer on the video as we produce it, but um, let's see this. So the mid Victorians were very healthy. What happened after that? And basically right around 1870, 1880, was the beginning of processed foods <clears throat> and shipping. Shipping became very inexpensive. So shipping and canning, hand in hand. So the poor mid-Victorians were uh, very busy, overworked, poor mid-Victorians defaulted to um, the beginning of processed foods. And that was uh, cheap, cheap foods. So that was their health downfall. Rather than growing in their, their own gardens and raising their own chickens and, and goats and whatever, now they were getting whatever they could, you know, whatever was inexpensive. Uh, of course, not knowing any better. But really, the other historic uh, figure, very important for health, is Weston A. Price. And he studied many different indigenous cultures. And what was really interesting about his work, being a dentist, he really looked at tooth and, and jaw formation. And, you know, we're, we're talking basically rock here. So all mineral, mineral absorption, mineral in the con food content related. And, of course, he and his family followed up on these uh, multiple indigenous cultures and showed that when they became westernized, the jaw, the tooth, you know, I know my own daughter, I mean, like her jaw was very narrow and her bone structure very weak and teeth were all out of place, you know? And I, I kiddingly told her that she, I know she didn't have a food allergy to corn curls because that was pretty much what the mother ate for nine months. So, but not a lot of nutrients um, in, in that food. Let's see. So, so Weston Price consistently found that healthy indigenous peoples consumed a diet containing at least 10 times the fat-soluble activators, not just nutrients, but fat solubles, vitamins found only in animal fat compared to the typical American diet of this day. Um, so really what we're talking about is activator X, now believed to be vitamin K2, but I have my cod liver oil here, and cod liver oil contains relatively decent amounts of all the fat-soluble activators, vitamin D, vitamin K, vitamin E, vitamin A. Vitamin A is a very important antiviral. Uh, we published that blog today, really taking a lot of stuff from the IFM on their antiviral protocol and their research. So um, really important, really important uh, that we get the, you know, you, you can't get that from algae. If you're a vegan or vegetarian, you're not, you know, the, the animals amplify and concentrate some of these important nutrients over time. Yes, the fish oil is really derived from algae, but it is a food chain after all. Um, so what they're arguing here, Weston A. Price, is that a lot of the shellfish typically have 10 times richer in vitamin D than even organ meats. So shellfish feeding on algae and insects feeding on green plants also would uh, have supplied the price factor or the activator X, believed to be K2, which is your calcium balancing um, fat soluble nutrient. So Dr. Price's pr uh, primary nutritional discovery was that when native people drop their traditional diets in favor of Western diets, rich in cheap white flour and refined sugar, vegetable oils and canned food, they paid a very steep price in the form of increased cavities and overall poor health. So that's, that's the whole thing. It's, it's, it's not about, it's not about calories. You know, so many of us, it's calorie counting. We ran a program, Dr. Kerner and I side by side with a um, calorie counting uh, weight loss program. And what we showed is people that already had a lot of inflammation, if they didn't follow our program and they really substantially followed the calorie counting program their inflammatory markers got worse. And we reported that to the company and they were not, nobody was very happy, but we, we have to tell the truth. I mean, relatively healthy people, they were okay.
But the ones, as Bernard said, that their interior is just out of homeostasis, out of balance, they, 100% of them, you know, our chronic disease temperature, 102 or more, they got worse in four to six months on a calorie restricted diet with no nutritional guidance. So what they really were is they were on a nutrient restricted diet, very bad thing. Uh, so Lauren Cordain, it's really interesting. The um, Institute for Human and Machine Cognition is a really good video channel. Um, and uh, he talks about the origins and evolution of the Western diet and the health implications for the 21st century beyond the scope of this talk to even look at any of that, but his credentials, um, he's a professor at Department of Health and Exercise Science at Colorado State University. And he basically, um, you know, reiterates what we already know, CDC, you know, 60% of us have at least one chronic condition. So, and these conditions are, you know, if you look at the, the work of Dr. Paul Ewald on the germ theory, um, the plague, plague time, the modern germ theory, he shows that the uptick in infectious diseases cannot be tied back to genetic, um, genetic, uh, any kind of genetic connection. It's happened too rapidly. And it's happened, interestingly, when you look at the work of Paul Ewald and what uh, Dr. Cordain is showing here and what the CDC documents in terms of the uptick in chronic conditions, there's a very clear connection between nutrient, nutrient density loss, chronic diseases, and infections per Paul, Dr. Paul Ewald out of uh, University of Louisville, all connected. So it's all, all wrapped together. You, you lose your terrain, you become more vulnerable, more vulnerable to an infectious and inflammatory diseases. And of course, um, you know, we presented this in I think um, the genesis of health that we did at the beginning of the year, but it basically shows, and, and this is, you know, Mike Adams is measuring this. Atomic absorption is very easy to measure. Every element has a fingerprint absorption. So you can differentiate sodium from potassium, from lithium, from strontium, from cobalt, you can tell. And then we have chromatography techniques to separate them into different, um, different segments. So you can see exactly what it is and how much of it's there. It's very easy, a very easy automated technique. Before the Germans did it, you know, way back, the good German chemists would do it through wet chemical means, but still there are techniques very accurate to measure how much iron, how much copper, how much selenium is in a sample. So even though this goes way back to 1900, chemical techniques were available to very accurately measure these important um, minerals. So um, this, this is real data. And what we're seeing is loss in minerals in the soil, which means loss of minerals in the plants, which means loss of minerals in the animals that eat the plants, but more importantly, the vitamins and enzymes that are driven by these nutrients. You know, if you don't have an active center making that enzyme work or that vitamin work, it will not work. Chlorophyll, there'll be no absorption of the sun without magnesium. Magnesium is at the center of a very complex molecule we call chlorophyll. No magnesium, no photosynthesis. It's that simple. So uh, this, is, this was done by the nutritionsecurity.org. But yeah, once again, very blurry, but this patent you know, is in archives from 1958. So it's the best I can do. But this is a great patent. I recommend everybody read it. Um, I cover the main points here and then we'll end for the evening. But basically Dr. Murray in his book, Sea Energy, uh, sea Energy and Agriculture, basically his, he posits that, you know, we've overused this, the soils, farm, farmland soils, erosion, all the nutrients that went into the uh, Mississippi Delta and the Gulf of, Gulf of Mexico. So let's take that back and put it back on the land. And those are the experiments that Dr. Murray did in the 1940s and 50s.
process applying sea solids as fertilizer. So the important thing is he's not putting in just, you know, ammonia and phosphorus. He's putting in a whole host of micronutrients that are sort of in the balance of what they were on the earth and now reflected by their concentration in uh, salty waters. But um, so once again, yes, blurry. Sorry, I'll read it. But um, let's see if I can do anything about this. Maybe I can make it a little smaller and it'll become a little clearer. Not so much, but census taken in 1935. Okay by the Department of Agriculture show that 61% of the total cropland or about 253 million acres was subject to continued erosion and would not give the farmer a satisfactory return on his invested time and in that 57 million acres of land had by then been destroyed from for tillage. In 1938, it was estimated by the US Department of Agriculture that on 12% of the total land area, erosion had removed more than three quarters of the original soil surface. Uh, surface soil on 37% of the land, about one quarter of the original surface soil had been lost. So this chart we show is completely consistent with the U.S. Department of Agriculture study of our farmland. So it's, it, it's, and it's been going on. It's not a, it's not something of our, of our most modern era. It, it dates back hundred years. Okay, so from the foregoing, it appears quite clear that defici deficiencies in elements or unbalanced amount of elements are reflected in food plants. Unbalance is an extremely important concept presented in Dr. Murray's, uh, Maynard Murray's patent in his subsequent book. Animals, we know, are dependent upon such plants for life and man is dependent upon both. Thus, it can be concluded step by step along the cycle of life that the diet may have pronounced effects upon health and disease in man. What, what he's really saying here, the subtext of this text, if you read the entire paragraph and you study this even further, is that it's just like in health. I, I always say, you know, Really, just take curcumin. That's the only herb. You know, it's more about balance. I mean, I know curcumin has some value, but in 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 the soil, when we just put in a small set of nutrients back in, even though they're important, it still hasn't created the balance that's needed to sustain optimal health. So everything that's going on in Nebraska and Iowa right now is largely going against what this statement says, is they're only putting in five to seven nutrients, not 28, not 50, whatever we really, whatever we really need to achieve balance in those plants. So we're, we're literally creating Franken plants. It's like an assembly line. I, I talk about this with a gut, you know, um, or a symphony. You know, assembly line, if you have... Um, a 20 component assembly line and 10 are, are revved up and perfect, but the other 10 are, are flagging, your widgets aren't going to be coming off very well. Or if the wind section doesn't show up in a symphony, it's not going to sound very good. It's the same concept of um, fertilization. You know, we're not letting the land lay fallow long enough. We're not, you know, so, so Murray was really onto something with the, the sea solids. And, um, as be here and before described, crops grown on soil fertilized with the above described fertilizer, which in this case is sea salt solids, have been analyzed for ash weight, vitamins, and elements, and production has been noted. The results indicate an increase in ash weight. That means there are definitely more minerals. Um, vitamins, number and proportion of elements. That's important, number and proportion and resistance to plant disease. So just putting sea solids on the soil made the plants more fungus and pest resistant. Don't need herbicides, don't need pesticides as much at least. Animals have been fed products grown on fertilized soil, once again, sea solid, 
see solids fertilize soil with the stimulus and growth in the animals and improvement in bone and tissue structure. Thus, it can be seen that the beneficial results of controlled use of sea solids with sea solids mixed with nitrogenous compounds are readily apparent. Not happening today. And that's where we shall stop. And I'll try to get clearer slides um, for the rest of us as we'll probably go on, we'll probably continue on this vein next Tuesday and next Monday as well. So let's see where most of the questions about the focusing. There's nothing I can do to focus on the computer. I'm sorry about that. Fondly referred to as quack signs by leading researchers like Dr. Tenpenny. I'm not, so they're th thanking Steve anyway. Um, I am very torn about Dr. Gundry's message. Can you comment? You know, I think he's taken advantage of the fact at least 60% of, of the people who come to me have a gut dysbiosis. It's probably greater. And yeah, absolutely. They're going to have problems with lectins, maybe purines, other, other things, toxins that are intentionally in plants. But if, you're, if your environment's good, I don't think you have any problem with that. I don't, I don't think I'm anything special. I eat everything Gundry says don't eat. And I never have dysbiosis. I think it's just the fact that it's very difficult to measure where you are on the gut health continuum. We don't have accurate measurements. So any of the most minimal symptoms probably infers that your gut is not optimal. So it's a lifelong pursuit in this environment of Franken foods and, and uh, excess gluten and Franken dairy and all that stuff to keep your, keep your gut in great balance. It's, it's a lot of work. But I think if you get there, you can eat pretty much anything. Michael, you know, we don't want to tear Gundry down. Do you, have a, you want to support Gundry? Well, I mean, <laughs> lectins are a plus or minus. Uh, again, I do, you know, food sensitivity testing, actually, you know, doing lectin testing at the peptide level for a whole host of them. And, um, and some people can tolerate some lectins and some not. So it really, if you really want to hone in on it, <clears throat> you get the, that um, lectin zoomer, among other zoomers, and um, we kind of go from there. But um, yeah, lectins can, can be problematic, you know, and of course, you know, if you pressure cook them, you know, and so forth, that, you know, definitely takes most of that problem away. Yep, I, I tell anybody with a presumed gut dysbiosis, probably don't eat raw for a while. Yeah. Uh, and here's someone, uh, Violet, thank you. Um, I've always refra reframed it from what I heard once. <clears throat> Not expensive to eat well, it's cheap to eat poorly. I like that. And cooking onions increases quercetin. You know, I mean, it, it's all a chemical reaction, and it's going to be a reaction you've got anyway. That's a, a major chemical plant. So pre-reacting, I mean, chewing in the saliva is, is pre-treating your food. So I think cooking is a good idea for most people that have um, any kind of gut problems. Try to, try to avoid raw. You okay with that, Michael? Yep, absolutely. Just like garlic, you want to let it oxidize for 15 minutes before cooking and eating. And you know, sprouting, I'm no expert on sprouting. Michael, any comment on Snow sprouting definitely is, is quite beneficial. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. How to get Brazil nuts without mold. <laughs> um, you know, um, chestnuts roasted on an open fire. You know, that can <laughs> hold. You just have to go to the right source. Yeah. 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 I mean, there are several sources online that, you know, really are good. They're yeah, higher end type nuts and seed companies yep i agree with amy don't overdo the brazil nuts about two right. of the rda um i read that mustard seed powder is highest in selenium that brazil nuts may not be as reliable due to soil content etc that's cool yeah that's true yeah there's there's no doubt i think the data we're showing you know 
even organic gardens, where you know, not regulated, where are they really coming from? That's why I think um, defensively, I, I plant my own garden. It's not huge, but what I manage and, and uh, renovate to, I can see where they're at and, and what they're doing. So I do have a couple eyes on where my food's coming from my my meat guy my vegetable guy and my own vegetables so uh, plants do not make minerals and of course they're not um if the brazil nut trees are not grown in soil high in selenium don't expect it to be in the nuts but it, it it's true but it, it does have a unique capacity of concentrating it that's why variety is important you know different foods will concentrate different minerals um Still, cow's milk has constituents to grow a calf to a full-grown cow. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I think goat milk has one half the casing. Louise says, I loved raw milk, but when a lime specialist, Theo, told me cows with lime could have that in their milk. Do you agree? That's beyond me, Michael. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> Um, lime can come from anywhere. It really is. It's, yeah, it's fairly u- ubiquitous now. It can even be sexually transmitted. Louise, Louise, the best defense to lime is muriatic acid. So if your gut has really strong acid, there's a, there's a good chance it won't survive uh, the first phase of digestion. We'd like to think. Yep. Um, Steve agreed. Uh, I took a cancer fighting cooking class where the size of cow's milk globules were examined under a slide. It showed how huge the globules were compared to human milk, deemed very unabsorbable and said to be a cancer contributor. It was said that we humans are the only species that cross drinks the milk of other species. And that is true. Differences of opinion. Thanks for commenting. I agree. <laughs> Steve, are you gonna meet you gonna tell me I can't have heavy cream in my coffee? <laughs> we may not be friends. Uh, that was actually Violet, I think, that uh, she was answering. Oh, you're right. Seven. Okay, yeah, thank I'll you. Be right back. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Violet. Violet. <laughs> Violet, we may not be able to be friends, but I am trying to wean myself off. Look, I, I just found a certificate from the Harvard School of Public Health. And I always thought my credentials were, was in just toxicology, but it was also in nutrition in the public interest. But they had a little tagline underneath it, and it said for me, do as he says, not as he does. Now it came right from Harvard. Okay, that's obviously a joke, but whatever. What is ammonium nitrate? I mean, that's, you know, it's a way to get nitrogen into the soil, and it's also an explosive, but... You know, when I look, when I drive out of my area where I live, unfortunately, we're in rural country with farmland, with glyphosate. And then what they do is they plant corn and the other year they plant soybean, corn, soybean. One, I'm not a farmer, but one pulls nitrogen out of the soil. The other one puts it back in. I mean, if you don't have a good nitrogen, you don't green up well. If you don't green up well, you're not going to produce a lot of energy. So you've got to have the nitrogen. Um, no conversion to active vitamin D either without magnesium. Absolutely. Fellow chat peeps, can you please post share what your favorite mineral supplement with brands are that you have found effective? Thanks in advance. Now, Dr. Carter on Monday says he gets a lot of stuff from trace mineral research. Um, I've been doing some fulvic humic um, liquid minerals that I put in I create a little carbonated drink with some sea salt and some potassium. Um, but I think Dr. Carter is uh, a big fan of trace mineral research. Did we lose you, Michael? No, I'm here. Yeah. No, it's very, very good. Very good products. And, but I'm much bigger fan of the cell core biosciences and products that a lot of them are fulvic and humic acid based. Yep. Uh, Gluco balance by biotics is one. Not familiar with that, but... Biotics uh, Research is a good company. Yeah, mm-hmm. excellent. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Louise says, my farmer neighbor speculates that the profusion of uh, ticks today may be caused by the great diminution of sulfur in the soil over the last 50 years. 
there's no question we have a diminution in sulfur, but I think one of the biggest reasons for the proliferation of ticks is the lack of forest fires. You know, that's, that's a conclusion I drew a little while ago. I'm not sure if it's, I haven't researched it, but you know, we no longer have these sort of checks and balances in nature anymore because of our human infiltration and, and control of, uh, of the environment so much. But um, sulfur could be part of it. It's never one thing. I used a good number of life extension. They have a new B12 that is both methyl and uh, adenosyl cobalamins. They both do different things in the body. Filling the land is bad news, disturbs the soil microbiome. Yeah, no-till is the, the way to go. Um, unless you have grass that has roots the size of my pinky here, then you got to get rid of them. Otherwise, it'll just squelch out your, uh, your plants. <laughs> so I do have to do a little digging. Thanks. Lost the whole chat log. Page crash. Which LE mineral formula do you like? I use Global Health B12 liquid combo is the LE1 liquid. Um, once again, Dr. Carter thinks Trace Mineral Research is a really solid yeah. brand there. Very good company. Mm -hmm. But there are, there are lots that have, you know, really great B12, you know, supplements and so forth. I mean, I like the sublingual version of um, the B12. Yeah. Michael Violet wants to know what our um, top three brands of probiotics are. Oh, so Megaspore, you know, would be um, probably the number one that is on our full script. Um, I would say Bravo Probiotic, which we're actually trying to get on there. That's um, by Dr. Marco Ruggiero, who we are very well acquainted with. Um, and then, um, and then there are a whole host of others out there um, that have that have very good quality, you know, probiotic uh, strains and so forth. Um, probably, you know, the Enzymedica Enzymedica line is a uh, is a really good um, is a really good company. Um, Claire Labs also has really good probiotics. There, there, are, there are quite a number of them out there, um, but really still looking at what your microbiome looks like, um, you know, from a, a, you know, guts, a gut test really is uh, quite helpful in kind of directing that. Yeah, because we don't have great measures for where you're on the continuum. So that's one. I mean, we, we need to be doing more testing in that area. Yeah. Um, will you have this webinar posted online later? Eventually, I posted Mondays today, actually, because I had some time this morning, but this one may not happen until the weekend. And uh, as an interjection with testing, I think, and hopefully, you know, Dr. Lewis and I are going to, with a group that we're working with who has some um, uh, very um, crucial connections with um, very large populations, we really need to, if anyone on this, you know, webinar is contemplating getting the vaccine, <clears throat> definitely you want to um, have your labs tested uh, probably no later than two weeks after getting the vaccine, because I'm already getting individuals that have had the vaccine and, you know, had just various um, complaints of, of different things, mild to moderate, not any severe ones. But my, of course, suspicion is, of course, and, and we know through the, the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, there are lots of reports of, um, you know, reactions ranging from mild, moderate to severe. But of course, you know, you don't have these reactions without having changes in your lab results. Mm -hmm. So I think this is going to be a, a tremendous opportunity for our company to test people because there are lots of people who want the vaccine. But from a long term standpoint, um, I think it's going to be very beneficial for us to gather data on individuals um, to see what their inflammatory and key markers look like. 
Uh, can I make a comment, Docs? Uh, so we all know how CRISPR works. They take yeah. uh, a bacterium uh, and they inject it into you and that bacterium can go in and actually edit and delete mm -hmm. uh, your DNA. I don't think any degree of uh, nutrients or uh, lifestyle or anything it will prevent that bacteria from doing what it's meant to do. Correct. And I realize it's a little tiny bit like apples and oranges, but it seems to me the um, these vaccines, especially the mRNA ones, it's kind of along the same lines. You're doing something that nature would never do, would not, has not done, et cetera. And I, I just can't see the the correlation between a, a, a good diet and lower inflammation, and everything, and pre and preventing the, that mRNA from doing what it's meant to do. Well, I, I think you know you're not going to be able to necessarily stop it, so to speak. However, the more robust your immune system is, the better it's going to be able to keep it in check. Because still, I mean, everyone is not going to have significant reactions from this, we hope, right? <laughs> I mean, no one really knows in the long term. That's right. Point, you know, but again, the more your system can modulate what it's seeing, that's that's really going to be the key. Well, Dr. Yeah, Tempe, I think, I think a Steve, comment. Oh, go ahead. I think, go ahead sorry. I think we're seeing an innate response. And, and so it's similar to COVID itself. And that's the paper that Dr. Carter and I wrote. It's really when you titrate back to the people that are dying and the measurements they're doing, they're seeing crazy ferritin. They're seeing crazy C-reactive protein. They're seeing. Right, yeah. So your pre-treatment status is all we have to work from. That's all we can do is improve your pre-treatment, you know, your pre-virus, your pre-vaccine status on these. And why Dr. Carter suggest that people come to us for testing is because you know there's not a lot of research on this so we can you guys can contribute to the just discourse on this by seeing you get the vaccine do physiological markers tied to the virus go up yeah and and that's what we need to know and if whatever markers go up believe you me the lower you can get them at baseline, the more likely you are not to have that adverse event or survive. Absolutely, and that's going to be the key. That's all. That's all we. That's all we have, and that's what we posited in a paper we published in a peer-reviewed journal. So, you know, that's the best we have, Steve. Do we know? No. No, we don't know anything. <laughs> no, no, we don't. But we do know. We do know that there are only a, in my in my view. We wrote a short book on this. You have a, you know, innate adaptive and your tertiary or secondary tertiary immune system. And those are always going to be involved in anything that's attacking us. Even, even the infections, if you know what you're looking for, that already are modulating the DNA of a cell that's infecting, you know, and that can go stealth and go into different forms. The immune system is still there. And guess what? It's still trying to, these organisms are smart. They're trying to evade the immune system. Well, the problem is, is uh, your, I, I think we've discussed this before. Your innate immune system is compromised severely with some of the vaccines. Yeah. And that's everything we're, you know, we're not, we're not messing with the, uh, the adaptive, but the adaptive is still quasi innate. It's producing ozone as well. But, I know, but the innate is a superior one, in my opinion. Oh, but, the, but the natural killer cells, because those that's the front line. Yeah. And that's what's yeah. going out and, yeah. you know, stopping the replication. So, you know, you know, there are individuals, you know, even going overseas to boost their natural killer cells with uh, stem cell infusions and so forth. But do you have to do that? No, you really don't. Um, they're, again, having an anti-inflammatory diet, being on various uh, supplements, um, again, again, identifying those things that are compromising your innate immune system, which they are myriad, you know? So, um, so you don't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars just to boost your natural killer cells, you know, artificially, so to speak. Um, but 
since that is the front line that is truly keeping this virus at bay and it's really not the you know cell mediated or antibody mediated immune system that's really the the key player here yes does it play a role yeah but i mean it's it's not the major it's not the major player it's just yeah, well uh, she said uh, it's it's basically coming down to the spike protein yeah. and these injections start you you turn your body into a, a spike protein manufacturing plant and the problem is the spike protein <laughs> is showing that it is detrimental to the vasculature. So oh, this is absolutely. We're getting the clot. Uh, Salk Institute just came out with a paper about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've had a couple of people who've had the vaccine and, you know, they're, they're having some issues. Oh, yeah. 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 So it's 9.04. What I'm going to do is save this chat. I'm sure I can figure out how to do it. I just go control A. And um, we'll try to answer some of these questions next week, but we're probably going to cover nutrient density and then go everywhere, anywhere it needs to go. And then I think it was Melissa that said, what I think about a fifth mechanism, really my fourth mechanism is, is stealth infection, but it's really stealth toxicity. And infection is a type of toxicity. The difference between it and other toxins is that it can it can replicate and grow. But I mean, if you read Paul Ewald's book, uh, Plague Time, there are virulent and very mild pathogens. So, you know, you compare them to toxins, they're really just a toxin. So I'll, I'll, I'll call it stealth toxins with um, infections being a, a, an important part of that, but not the only part. So for mechanism four, so. But anyway, with that being said, um, we've got the, We've got the um, chat saved, and hopefully we'll get to some of these next week. Any closing remarks, Michael? No, nope, that's all. Good deal. Okay. Thanks very much, and we're gonna Thanks. we'll continue this topic next week.